Hey, Friday. All right, we'll just hit record uh, to all of our friends online. Thanks for joining us. If uh, you would not like to be seen on this video, uh, then just hide your screen. That's fine. Uh, but really nice for you to be joining um, us for this. And particularly to the people in the room, thank you for coming. It's nice to do things face to face, time to time, isn't it? So anyway, I actually realised as uh, as I was standing here about three minutes ago that I probably got should have got someone to introduce me because I'm actually the presenter for this first uh, first presentation in the series. I'm really just the warm up act because in October we have Brett Mitchell who will be talking to us as part of this, and we've got some other uh, guests who'll be coming in as well. But uh, yeah, for those I think I know everyone, but uh, my name's Darren, and um, I'm the director of the Lifestyle Medicine Health Research Centre here. And uh, yeah, what I want to do today is just share with you some of the work that we're doing in this in, in, in the research space. And there's a bit of a story attached to this, and I love stories. And I know it's been said you never let the facts get in the way of a good story, but I'm going to keep it factual today. I promise. My brother's in the room, and he sort of has that grimace, like, "Yeah, I'm not quite sure." But I promise, Jace, I'm going to do my best. And you're welcome to pull me up if you think that I go off the off the script. So. Um, Look, within the, the Lifestyle Medicine Health Research Centre, we have a, a number of um, themes um, and you're going to be hearing from those as as, uh, as as time goes on. But really the area that I'm most immersed in is, is what's referred to as lifestyle medicine and, and positive health. And, and I'm very, very passionate about that. I hope you can see my um, my screen behind me for those that are on Zoom. But I've titled this um, Localised Lifestyle Medicine. And, and really there this, the reason I'm pitching this as a story is because it is a story that's un, un, unfolding and it hasn't ended yet. And I have um, dreams and aspirations for what the end of the story will will, will sound like and how it will be told. Um, but, you know, in some regards, it's sort of exciting to be on an adventure, you know, where you see things um, unfold uh, in, in real time. And one thing that's interesting that I've found, and this is from a research perspective as well, is that sometimes it's really worthwhile taking notice of things that just happen organically you know things that just come along because often if you have to push for something it's probably going to be a constant push whereas if there's almost a pull then uh, then it seems that things seem to, to flow um you know a lot easier so this story is i suppose a little bit about um a, a pull imperative as compared to a push one so just to kick off, my uh my i've had a quite a transition in my my research career and my research focus I started off focusing on pain, and I don't know if that's a good place to start. But in a former life, I was uh, I was very very interested in in exercise, and uh, I was even as a young person could almost be referred to as an athlete. Um, and I used to suffer a lot of issues with this thing called the stitch, you know, this pain in the side. Anyway, it turned out this was sort of showing my age, but this was early, sort of probably mid nineties. I was lining up to do a PhD program, and I thought, what could I study? And I was just really interested in this particular topic. And it turned out that not, there had not been one paper published on the runner's stitch since 1951. And this was, would have been about 1995, 96 by this time. So like 45 years, no one had researched this at all. And I thought, what a great topic. And so I managed to convince a, uh, a professor in, at Newcastle University in the medical faculty there to take me on as a student. And she goes, you realise that researching pain is very, very problematic she said, because it's subjective experience. And what are you going to do? Are you actually going to set up experience where you cause this thing? You're going to actually cause people pain and then sort of leverage off their experience? And I said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> so anyway, I, went up, well, I did my PhD on that topic and it turned out to be quite an amazing experience, really. Within a very short space of time, uh, we actually came up with a, a novel theory on what was causing uh, the runner stitch and we published that. And so my one claim to fame, Right. To this day, I'm the world expert on the runner stitch, which uh, my and my my standard joke. This is not a joke; it's a true story, Jace. My youngest son, Caleb, came home from school. This was a couple of years ago. He's in year eight, and he goes, "Hey, Dad!" He goes, "We were like re like googling our dads to see if they'd done anything special." And he goes, "You're like the world expert on that pain in your side." And I said, "Caleb, could be a whole lot worse, mate. I could be the world expert on being a pain in the beehive." <laughs> So anyway, um, but what happened is I think, you know, coming from an exercise background and having an interest in a whole heap of other areas relating to, to health and well-being, 
I came to this dawning, and you know, I'm a slow learner. I, I've, I've come to realize that. But I suppose my epiphany was that really the reason I was so passionate about trying to get people to be more active, right? That was one of the key things I was involved with, is because I wanted people to just feel better. Right? That was actually the end goal for me. And what I came to, under, came to understand is that a lot of the work I was doing in helping people to even eat healthier, you know, and manage their stress better, they were all just initiatives to help people to feel better. Right? And why do I want that? It was because when you feel better, you're actually in a better place to be able to, you know, make a difference in the world. And I believe that we're all here, you know, to make some sort of unique contribution. And so I actually, over time, and I became more and more immersed in not just in the the pain literature and, and stitch and even exercise, it, it just kept broadening and growing. And, and really my, my, I suppose, my passion and interest. And, and I think back now, even as a little tacker, I was just always intrigued by this thing. And that is really this, this well-being, you know, or if you want to put a cheesy name to it, the idea of being happier, you know, what does that look like? And, and the literature here has just exploded over the past couple of decades. And, and, and I find it you know, completely intriguing. And what we know is there are different types of well-being. There are different types of happiness, call it that. Um, if you wanted to sort of put it under two big categories, one category is referred to as hedonic well-being. Now, this is the, the, the feeling good piece, you know, the hedonia. And then the other one is, is what we refer to as eudaimonic well-being. And eudaimonia is really about, you know, living true to your values, you know, making a difference in the world, having a sense of purpose and meaning. And so... I, I thought to myself, you know, I, I've actually always been interested in, in, in both those things. And so my operational definition of well-being, if you want one, or happiness, is just this. It's about feeling good and feeling good about life. And what we know is that um, when it comes to those two things, right, and they actually, it's interesting, they can, they can exist independently. So they're complementary, but they can exist independently. You can actually have people who will say, I'm having a way over time. You know, it's just party, party, party. But you know what? In my quiet moments, I actually don't feel that great about my life. And you can have the reverse. You can actually have people say, you know what? I'm doing it really hard at the moment. I'm not experiencing high levels of positive effect and a positive emotion. And yet, I still feel pretty satisfied with my life and, and happy with that. Now, obviously, you can get the two going for you. Then really, you're in a position to what we refer to as is starting to flourish. That's the, the construct that's often used in the, the positive psychology literature. But, you know, we talk about feeling good and feeling good about life. The reality is today many people aren't. And, you know, I hate these stats, but you look at these sorts of things here. This is, this is trends. Just this is like an engram viewer looking at Google searches for things like how to stop anxiety, how to stop depression. And what you can just see is this, you know, the, the, and, and this actually cut off before the pandemic, by the way. And so we just see this upward trend. You know, it's just migrating upwards all the time. You look at in Australia today, about one in eight um, adults will be taking antidepressants. We were taking that this morning. And you know what? Medications have an important role to play. But you know what? For me, this is a surrogate telling us that many, many people are not feeling good and feeling good about life. And they're looking for solutions. Um, in fact, that's, that has more than doubled in the past decade. Right? So the trajectory is going all the wrong way. And then, you know, when you throw a pandemic on, on top of it, I remember reading this paper when it came out the very morning it did, during June 10, I think it was, yeah, in, uh, in MJA, Medical Journal of Australia. And this is what they said, that, that actually in 2020, they looked at the rates of mental distress within the first month of COVID lockdown alone. And you can see the, 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 the conclusions there, mental health problems were at least twice as prevalent. And most countries around the world, we've seen that, we've seen this doubling in some cases, tripling of mental distress, you know, depression, anxiety. So Houston, you know, we've got this big problem on our hands and that's a great place to start for a research endeavour, isn't it? And for a research initiative with a, with, a, with, a, with a problem like that, a research problem. And so I, you know, being immersed in the, the lifestyle medicine space and, and really, I suppose, up until, well, you know, going back probably about 2008, we started to see this formalisation of this discipline called lifestyle medicine. And, and lifestyle medicine was really um, focused on, on creating and shifting a paradigm for healthcare uh, with relation to chronic disease. And I love the fact that within our research centre, we sort of, you know, we, we do that, we have the infectious disease piece, but this chronic disease is sort of at the space that I have it more diabetes, heart disease, done a lot of work in creating interventions, um, helping with that. 
And really the, the paradigm, you know, and I like this little illustration to represent really what's, what's captured by the lifestyle medicine community. And that is that at the moment, our healthcare system, if you look at how it deals with chronic conditions, is we park an ambulance down the bottom of the cliff. We wait for people to fall off the edge and then we pride, pride ourselves on the fact that we have some great surgical interventions we can use. We have some pharmacological um, interventions that we can, can employ. You know, great, valuable, not discounting that at all. But you know what? Maybe there's a better way, right? Because at the heart of it, if you look at chronic diseases, another name for them can be lifestyle-related diseases. You know, it's about how people are eating, how they're moving or not moving, how they're managing their stress, how socially connected they are, whether they have meaning purpose in their life. All of these factors, we know, these lifestyle factors play into people's experience and progression of chronic, of chronic disease. And so, you know, what might be a better approach here is maybe to put a fence up the top of the cliff right? or maybe even just help people to shuffle further away from the edge of the cliff, right? And that could be, you know, really what that, that's hinting at is this whole idea of resilience. You now, everyone thinks about resilience is when you hit the bottom, you can bounce back up. And you know what? Maybe resilience is about having some buffer zone as well so that you don't fall off the edge. You know, you can, you can weather some of these, these challenges of life. And so that's really that the space that lifestyle medicine had applied to the management of chronic physical conditions like diabetes and heart disease. But I was involved in you know, research in that space. And what was intriguing me is that whilst we were running these interventions for people with heart disease and diabetes, consistently they're reporting that, you know what, I just feel better. I feel better. And that really started to resonate with me. Because what the, you know, the, the mounting evidence started to demonstrate is that, hey, you know what, the things, the principles of lifestyle medicine that are great for your body are also exceptionally good for your brain. And so lifestyle medicine started to pivot and you know, become more encompassing and actually speak into the mental health space as well. And so, you know, I'm watching the, you know, this escalating rise in, in mental health, mental distress, seeing that lifestyle medicine has a role to play there. And I thought, you know what needs to happen is we need to um, not be sort of, you know, monotherapy in, in, in the way that we deal with this. We need to throw everything we've got at this this uh, this this crisis, and so here comes da -da 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 -da, and you, I'm sure you've heard about this before. But the creation of this this intervention called the Lift Project started in 2015. Um, I just thought, you know what, I want to do this. I just want to do this. I want to get it out there. And so we actually offered a free program in the Morissette Community Hall uh, in, over here. We had 100 people show up, ranging in age from eight to 92. And here I was, I presented this thing live, and what it was effectively were these 10 evidence-based strategies that we know could help to lift someone's mood and their life, right? that hedonic, eudaimonic well-being. And so here are the lessons. So um, it basically it pulled in all of the, you know, it was about 400 studies that I drew off here uh, and created a, a bit of a framework, a bit of a structure for this program. It, it drew in um, a bit of neuroscience, so I was teaching people how their brains worked. Um, lifestyle medicine strategies, so you know, nutrition and physical activity and that. And then a lot of the work that was coming out of the positive psychology space as well. And what I, I really appreciate about the positive psychology space is it's not fluffy pop psychology, it's a scientific endeavor, but it's essentially the study of, of what can help people not to just mend misery, because that had been the obsession of you know traditional psychology, trying to get people with some sort of dysfunction. Most of us have one, by the way, so that feel bad about you. But then trying to get these people up to just being okay, again, just normal. I don't know, it's normal nowadays either. But, um, but when, does, when did psychology ever help people to actually move from, you know, into these more positive states, you know, to actually do better than okay, um, to flourish as compared to just, you know, mending, languishing? And so um, there was a whole lot of really good learnings that were coming out of that. And so I thought, let's just pull all of this together into an educational adventure. And this is where my... You know, educator heart started to come into play. So here were the lessons. So lesson one, your limbo is listening. I teach people all about the limbic region of their brain, which is the emotional brain. Give it a nickname because that's what we Aussies do. Call it the limbo. Show how language has a huge impact on it. And we speak to ourselves and to other people. You know, just complimenting other people can make a difference to our own well-being. Engaging with inspirational literature. You know, bibliotherapy, they call it. Very, very powerful for changing our mood state. Motion creates emotion. That's all about why movement can affect your, um, you know, how you feel. And, you know, my 
perhaps biased opinion, but I think the science is pretty strong on this, is that physical activity is probably one of the most powerful and yet least utilised antidepressants we have available to us. It certainly compares and you, the studies, you put it back to back against um, antidepressant medication, it'll often be it. So very, very powerful strategy. Blue and green should often be seen. Vitamin N, just getting outside into nature. Right? There's in the science, the studies that are coming out in this space, very, very, very interesting. So yeah, it feels better. It's all about relationships. Right? We, are, we are wired to connect with others. How can we strengthen those relationships? What can we do? Explore some of those strategies. Feeling slowly at focus comes from the positive psych space, which is really showing that when people adopt a positive focus, like, you know, intentionally think about things they're grateful for, right, the things that are, that are going well amidst all the other stuff that's often not because that's live, um, things that we're excited about, things we're hopeful for, can actually be a real game changer in terms of our mood state. Food, feed your mood. Uh, all about nutrition, obviously. Rest, feel your best is sleep. Uh, stress less. You know, principles like uh, mindfulness, which is very, very Christian, by the way, if you, in case if you're not familiar with what it's all about. Establishing work-life balance. You know, the idea of having a sabbatical each week is actually a really quite a powerful evidence base. There's some really fascinating studies on that. Take all the religiosity away from it. The idea of having one downtime day a week is incredibly good for our stress levels. Uh, and then, you know, those top lessons, those first eight really speak to that hedonic wellbeing piece, helping people to feel better. And then the last ones are a bit of a deeper dive into the eudaimonic expressions of wellbeing, which really relate to, you know, what's your, what are your signature strengths you know, and how can you use them for good, right? And what's your story, you know, that you're telling, that you're living? Right? How is that influence? You know, and we know that those sorts of questions and reflecting on them can be really uplifting for people as well. So that's the ninth called giving is living, and the last one is called um, what does it take to flourish. So here's just a little snapshot of what the what the lift project is all about. Basically, we uh, it, it started to scale. So we ran it for the local um, count uh, local community hall, and then there was interest in, in other sectors as well. And so here is just a little two minute trailer to give you a feel of what it's all about. Today, we are facing a well-being crisis. Rates of depression and anxiety are escalating worldwide and it's impacting us either personally or through those we care about. But there is light in the darkness. I'm kind of pissed off at that. And for as long as I can remember, I've been fascinated by the hell. Oh, this led me to dive deep into research from the fields of neuroscience, lifestyle density, and positive psychology, which is showing that we see in our life circumstances and genetics, which determines about half of our habits, we get to choose the other half through our daily choices. Diet is the single leading predictor variable for all cause mortality and total risk of chronic disease in developed countries around the world. The old fashioned way that big behavior changes was to kind of scare ourselves. As we've learned more about positive psychology and the power of positive emotions as a driver of those health behaviors, is that we're naturally driven to a lot more positive experiences. Is anything that really know how fabulous the body and mind will feel? I invite you to join me in educational adventure. We will talk to renowned experts, conduct fun experiments, and discover the important science based strategies that can help you live food and your life. And I'll show you not just what these strategies are, but also why and how they work. So that's a little, that, you see that surface paddling out there? You know, that's Jason I. And they said, let's get, we'll get a photo, uh, some video of a drone. We'll get a video of you guys catching waves. And then we caught it and I didn't catch it properly. And I fell off and Jace kept going. And I said, don't use that. <laughs> so anyway, but look, that gives you a bit of a snapshot as what the program about. Really, there was a couple of things I was super intentional about that. What we know is that, you know, so many people are struggling today with their mental health and well-being, but no one wants, well, many people don't want to put their hand up and say that to me. 
And so that's why having a program like a depression recovery program, you know, there's stigma attached to being part of that. And so we wanted to create something that was pitched in the positive. You know, the lift projects, lift your mood and your life. I don't care if you're down here or you're up here, surely it's still like a little bit more of a lift. And so it really became something that was, that was quite accessible to people. So there was no stigma attached to being part of it. All pitched in the positive. So um, it was never about dwelling on the woes of life. It was just saying, hey, you know what? The science says this can help you to feel better or feel better about life. Why wouldn't you want to try that? And so here's some challenges that you could try for a week that would involve putting homework into action. Um, so we actually created it as an online delivery, but really designed for, to bring people to, together, to engage with something um, together. And then it was it's very comprehensive, obviously, in its approach. And so then we had interest from for a variety of different areas. So workplaces, you know, we saw application there um, in schools and universities. And in fact, all of our first year students here at Avondale University do it as part of their um, that unit called Foundations of Wellbeing in the first semester of the first year. And we've collected data on that since 2016, and we've got some great papers that we need to write up. And I was actually going to talk with you if you're really interested in being part of that. And my personal view is that I believe that initiatives like this have played into Avondale University ranking number one for student experience. Mm -hmm. I honestly do. This is this is putting our money where our mouth is in terms of what matters to, to us. You know, it's our, our values are, are demonstrated. Um, community, I'll come back to, and then we actually have some health um, clinics where doctors would actually use it for their patients in, you know, as shared medical appointments. So I had this big, hairy, audacious goal that kicked off in 2016, ran it in Morissette, and just saw this need, and I just saw green light, green light, green light, get it out there. I don't believe there is one person on the planet that doesn't need to do the lift project. But there's... <laughs> I know that you know you're rolling your eyes at me. And that's okay. No, you weren't. I made that. I was looking at my brother. And Kirsty's completely on the board. Um, but you know what? The, the 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 mission is to lift 10 million lives worldwide. So that is a big, big, hairy, audacious goal. But I actually, I honestly believe it's possible if it's meant to be. And so we'll find out, and I'll let you know in 10 years' time where we go. But what I can tell you is that it's being used in multiple countries now. Um, it's endorsed by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. We have a Chinese translation of the program now, which is just kicking off this year. So and if, 10, if we're going to get 10 million lives, that's probably where it's going to happen. <laughs> There's a lot of them over there. Um, so, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. But I want to share with you specifically this one that happened quite organically, and it's the, the community case. So... Oh, we we had done we did RCT, so we started to you know run some trials. We had a couple of PhD students working on projects, and what we were seeing is you know good evidence that when people engage with this, and that's often the hard bit, getting people to engage. But when people engage with it, on average, we're seeing you know sort of thirty to forty percent reductions in depressive symptoms, anxiety, and stress, which fascinates me because this is a positively pitched program. No, it's not it's not targeting that specifically but on in addition to that so it's sort of it's it's negating the negative but it's also promoting the positive because we see vitality going up life satisfaction scores going up flourishing scores going up and so what i think is so exciting about it is that this one approach can be helpful for people at all ends of the, the mental health continuum spectrum in uh, a non-confronting way you know in just a, a positive way so coronavirus, is that what it actually looks like, Brett? Yeah. Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. Well, um, the beginning of 2020, we get contacted by um, Sunshine Coast Council and they go, hey, you know, we know about your projects. We've got massive issues up here community-wide. Is there something we can do on a large scale? And I've just gone, I like large scale. That sounds good to me. That really aligns nicely with lifting 10 million lives. And I said, this is about impact, let's get creative. And so we came up with a model whereby we said, you know what, let's just set up a platform where in partnership with the council, you can offer this for free to your entire community. And so we'll set up this, this sort of unique um, registration page. This is another program we ran for, for Lake Macquarie. They call it Let's Live Lake Mac. Um, and what happens is you can just promote this right throughout your region and say that as a, as a community, we're going to go on this well-being journey together, right? Please join us. And so they said, let's have a crack at it. Let's just see. And so I'm going, we're going to learn some things. And so let's have a try. 
So we opened this up. Um, they promoted it amongst their network. Their mayor got on television because mayors love to be part of this sort of stuff. You know, we care about you. And so, you know, we're doing this for you. We have 4,000 people register in that first round. And um, what we then did is we created the City of Adelaide. They've run it now too. We created a, a custom branded version of the program for that community. And so every week when the next lesson became available, it would feature all the local resources. So motion creates emotion, lesson two. You know, they're just moving more. You don't have to exercise, by the way, because that's painful and sweaty. Who wants that? But just moving can actually lift your mood in your life. And did you know that in our area we have 16 park runs that meet? Here are where they, they happen. You could get involved in connecting to that. Did you know we've got this lesson three, blue and green shots can be seen? Did you know that just getting outdoors for 30 minutes a day is really uplifting? And in our area, did you know that at Rathmines we have Frisbee golf? Um, have you ever tried that? Great thing. Okay, let's do that. So it became essentially this community development initiative. And so we started to, to roll this out, featuring the local resources. This is one we actually just finished this one um, a few weeks ago. This is Marunda City Council in Victoria. And you can see their custom page here. And there's their mayor, little video, smile away. Love and life, I'm part of it. Yeah, thank me. Vote for me too. Um, but what happened with Marinda was really quite fascinating. And once again, this is an organic growth story. They said, can we get some partners involved in this? We said, absolutely, you can. So they reached out and they said, we've got all these community groups. Um, each is a is a, a community interest group. We had, um, you see, they've got their different journeys, their communities of wellness. East, Eastland Shopping Centre said, you know, we would like to be part of this. So they actually started, they had signs where they promoted it. Uh, there was even some faith-based groups that got involved in it. And I thought, I love this model. You know, all of a sudden this is becoming more and more of a community development initiative. Then they said, and I love this, and because this was always the intent. Um, I'm going to have to stop talking soon. I get excited about this stuff. But anyway, um, the lady there, community development officer, Fiona, she goes, hey, could we have some, we've got lots of people that are displaced, you know, who are disconnected, isolated, lonely in our community. Could we have public meetup groups where people could just tap into? And I said, well, you know what? We already have a, a, a group leaders toolkit, like a little hosting kit. It's really easy to do because all that happens is these people come along, they watch a 15-minute video presentation where I show the science behind it, and they talk about what they just learned. That was new to them. And then I give them a couple of challenges to try for the week. They talk about how they could make that work. And then they go on their way. They meet up an hour a week. I said, go for it. So she said, she came back to me. She goes, yeah, we've got nine groups. The local library was running a program. There was a group here. There was a group there. And so just a couple of weeks ago, I went down to Melbourne and met with these group leaders and just said, what did you learn? You know, what did you work out? I'll tell you what, it was serious. It was like a bit of focus group with them, but it was just exciting to be in the room with these people. They, honestly, they, they would just felt like they'd given back, you know, they were, they were all free to the community. And so it was really, really exciting. Um, so then what happened What happened over the course of the program, these people registered. We have an official start date. And then over the next 10 weeks, the, each new lesson unfolded and they got access to that. We give them like a little prompt in the middle of the week, an email communication which says we, we call a midweek lift, just to remind them of the challenges they were, they were having to try out for that week. And so that's how the program rolled out for them. And I bother about that. The councils um, would then run a, a dedicated social media site and normally in, in their Facebook format. And that was just a really nice way for the community to be able to talk about, hey, we went and tried fr Frisbee golf and it was really awesome. I never knew that existed. And I've lived here for 25 years and you know, people are talking about what they're learning and what they're doing. Um, and so they had the social media site. That we this, uh, I'll, I'll speak to that last one, the, where the opportunity exists also is to, to tap onto this larger scale community events. So, for example, um, you know, a, a, a picnic in the park right, on, a, on the Food Feed Your Mood Week. And so this is another touch point where people could come and tap into and it could be a, a community development issue. And then, of course, those group meetups that I mentioned to you before, and so obviously as part of this, we always do collect some data at the end, get some, um, you know, some feedback. And honestly, it's just amazingly heartwarming, you know, the stories that come out. So, you know, on average, it's, it's very seldom that we don't see at least not, you know, over 95% of the participants saying, I would recommend this to a friend. 
And you know, normally it's it's over ninety percent at least of people who say improved my health and wellbeing, gave me skills for you know managing my my mental health and wellbeing during challenging times. Um, will have a positive long term influence on my wellbeing. And then there's these open ended questions that people respond to, and and the stories that come out just are really 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 cool. Like I was just reading um, the report from the Rwanda City Council, and one lady said, "My husband." <laughs> He's changed. <laughs> and I'm going, wow, I could sell that idea. <laughs> I'll make a fortune. But um, so it's just been rolling out and it's starting to grow. And so um, what we soon realise is that, hey, this is, doesn't need to be a geographical region. This could be actually something that an organisation needs for their entire community. And so the beginning of this year, we, we were contacted by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And they said, could we do this as a member benefit initiative? We'll go on this wellbeing journey together. So let's go for it. So we had, um, here's the report from there, more than 1,700 physicians from the US sign up to this initiative, roll it out, and you can see, you know, once again, really heartwarming, you know, stories. Um, and so it's growing. So this thing, so things that we're, we're, we're doing, um, well, what, I, I, what I'm calling this is localised lifestyle medicine. Right, this is, this is a, 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 a community-based, um, to, you know, community development initiative that also has this provision for social connection and reconnection. And so, you know, whilst we haven't got any massive grants for this yet, I, I can just see it coming. I feel like there's, a lot of this is the groundwork, you know, to demonstrate proof of concept of what can be done. And it's interesting, you know, that I see a lot of the grants that are coming out now, they're all talking about community-wide mental health support and social reconnection. And I think this is sort of connecting those, those two things in a, in a really evidence-based way. So um, what I love about this uh, is that you know, it's a community development and connection initiative. It's large scale reach and large scale impact. Um, and I love that the fact that partners can get involved as, as part of that as well. I really like the equity that the fact that it becomes freely available to, to all, all, all people. You know, Mike, I would, I would, if we ever have, normally individuals can actually purchase the project and do it in their own accord. But if we ever have anyone that says, I can't afford it, but I need it, you know, they just, they get access to it. I, that will never be, but I love the way that this is, you know, this is, that's very equitable. And, that, and it champions this, this cause, this name, lifestyle medicine, right? Because I'm still flabbergasted at the number of physicians that are, you know, GPs and specialists who have never heard of lifestyle medicine. I don't know who that is. So, um, yeah, so I really do love everything about this. So, what I think, um, it must be um, yeah. um what, what I love about this, this is, uh, this is just to, to lose back. <laughs> Don't turn that off even. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what I love about this, my, my big research agenda, I suppose, is that I think the narrative has changed in the lifestyle medicine space or in that in this in this area of research. In the early stages, everyone was refuting um, and questioning whether lifestyle medicine actually worked. Right? And now the evidence is too overwhelming. Now, you know, I talk with, you know, doctors and that and they say, oh yeah, but you know, it doesn't work. And you know, oh, just because you get people to exercise more or eat they're healthier. There's I, I I literally I talk with cardiologists to, even today who'll say, Nutrition has no impact on you know disease progression at all, and I think to myself, this is just not in 1990. Dean Ornish first published his paper showing that through you know therapeutic lifestyle change, you can regress stenosis. You can actually you know start to actually not just slow the progression, you can actually reverse you know atherosclerotic plaques. So this this is 30 years ago, people. How have you not heard this? And in 2018, the Lancet published a paper saying when it comes to type 2 diabetes. In primary health settings, um, for about fifty percent of people, you know, uh, with diabetes, remission, complete remission of that condition, should be the the realistic goal. Right? This is the Lancet publishing. So the the narrative's changing. It's not about does this work. We know it works. The bigger question is, well, how do we make it work best so that people get excited about it and actually engage with it and do it? And what that will take is a massive data set where we have initiatives where uh, we can play with a whole lot of variables like you know we can see well you know different age groups 
definitely you know, gender. Um, what about when people do it in an online setting or completely online by themselves or they do it in a meetup group or uh, if there's a different type of facilitator? And I, I, what I think is potential to do here, and this is part of my, my, my journey long term, is to actually set up essentially what could be the world's largest lifestyle intervention where we just have hordes of data. We collect information from all different parts of the world and start to be able to tease out and explore, you know what, for males in that age group, probably the best scenario to get best impact and outcomes is this, you know. And so I think there's, there's, there's massive potential here from a research perspective. So what I do want to tell you is that um, there's keep going, on, obviously, but... Last year, we actually offered um, the lift project to Lake Macquarie City Council. We had 4,000 people register, which is pretty cool. But this year, um, it's back and it kicks off on September uh, 18. And it's a new updated program, which we're really excited about. This is in partnership with, with um, the council. And obviously, you can see it in the flyer. So it's, it's Lake Macquarie City Council, it's Avondale University and the lift project. We've actually got some sponsors who, who took this on as well and we really appreciate to them. Adra Op Shop, we're on board. Eight at Trinity, Good Food there, go there. Brad Renshaw Real Estate, the Rotary Club. So we're actually getting a lot more interest from these, you know, other community interest and development groups and, and NGOs. Southern Cross Fitness, um, Waddington Park have sponsored it. But what's happened is, um, in partnership with council, it looks like we're going to have quite a few programs running throughout the community. Uh, I know Adra Op Shop are hosting one. Toronto Library are going to have a program running. Catalina Retirement Village is going to have a program running when this kicks off and they're going to be journeying through together in their respective groups. So register. It's free, right? So I'll leave this little thing up the front. There's a QR code where you can you can get on it. All you do is put your name and your email address in there um, and spread the word. I, would, I really want this one to be bigger and better. We're actually writing um, the last year's results up for a paper at the moment for um, Australian um, Health Promotion Journal. But this is going to be even bigger and better. I actually think um, I can tell you that two days ago, it looks like we've had another entire community in Athens, Ohio, that have just signed up for it. And that's going to be in partnership with Ohio State University because um, they want to be part of that. They're centred in that team. So anyway, I'm going to stop talking now. You might have a couple of questions, but I, I hope that just gives you a bit of an insight as to to what you know we're doing in this space and and i think the potential of this not just to produce research output and outcomes the more important thing for me is actually to have a measurable impact on on the lives of people you know at a time when they really need it i think this is something we can be really proud of you know as an institution and and um you know obviously brett's doing remarkable work in, in, in his space you know we've got some great things going on here for a small little institution Hey, we're not all only great at, at um, our student experience. We're, we're, we're punching so far above our weight and, and, and really showing leadership on the, on the world stage in, in how these things can be done. So, da -da 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 -da. done. Yeah. Anthony, any questions? Yes. yes. It could be more than five as well. Score zero at the bottom. Yeah, I often get asked, "What are you up to?" Like this, and I thought I, I refrain from answering that because I want to be like at least sort of. But you know, I, I estimate from about thirty thousand people so far have engaged in that. So we've got a long, long way to go. It's thirty thousand people. It's thirty thousand people, and you know what? Sometimes, and that's a good, that's a really nice thing to think about. You know, sometimes you got to go because I'm just I live out here. And sometimes it's good to pull back and go, you know what? My well, Sarah's actually a bit of a mining fact. You know, it's, it's it's actually still doing good work now, even if it doesn't that be hag. Um, but you know what I can tell you, there is honestly there's, there's some exciting stuff happening. I even this morning I, I um, had a Zoom call with Advent Health in the US. And they're a massive healthcare system. Um, I've met with um, the Mayo Clinic as a health system because there's potential to actually create a branded version of the program for their entire big base. Um, I actually had another call this morning. We're, we're, we're looking at working in partnership with the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine, because where they see in the, um, an opportunity is with Health Fund. So with Lupa, you know, having their own version of offering next to their entire members. Not only is it a great goodwill thing, but it actually could potentially save them 
you know, return on return on investment is very powerful. But I, I personally, I, I want to see my dreams move forward. I actually want to see this offered in every community around Australia, you know, free access. And what that will take is some good national sponsors or some good grant funding to, to make that available. Um, but I have had meetings. My, one of my dreams for this is to actually get Woolworths on board because I want people to be able to exit a checkout at Woolworths and there'd be a sign there, big one that says, need a lift, join the lift project in our community. It kicks off on this day. It'll feature where they can go to to tap into these groups, QR code, scan it right there. And I've tried so hard to get to the, to the top of the tree at um, Woolworths and they just hide themselves. And then... I was at the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine Conference about three weeks, four weeks ago in Cairns. And I, 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 I was one of the MCs in the event, so you sort of, you know, people get to know you a bit. Anyway, we had a stand promoting our lifestyle medicine course and I walked over to the stand and Mel ran for a, just finished chairing a session. Mel was behind the stand. She goes, oh, here comes Darren now. And I walk up and, and she, this lady goes, oh, hi, I'm Stevie. I said, oh, hi, Stevie, nice to meet you. She goes, yeah, I'm the National um, Health and Wellbeing Brand Manager for Woolworths. And I, I've gone, I've been looking for you. Like this, and she's like, I think she was a bit yeah. taken aback by our response. But anyway, I've had a couple of Zoom sessions with her as well because my dream is that Woolworths would be the brand ambassador, you know, and they're the ones who, you know, they get the PR value of it. But hey, you know what? Woolworths, Avondale, Beach Project. Get me down the line. Oh, too <laughs> I think it's mum trying to me too. Oh, We're in trouble. Oh, yes. Sorry, I'll So the question was um, from Carolyn, what in terms of an equity um, and access to the program in aged care settings where people might not be tech savvy and be able to access it online? Um, so that's a, that's a really good point. We've actually got some aged care groups that are running it, but they, it's the face-to-face -face thing that becomes really valuable there. And I actually see, this, you know, often the retirement villages, that obviously aged care is the, the next level up from that, but that they almost, they need a host to organise it. And then you know, they engage with it all together, and they, they, they play the video. So yeah, that that's yeah, that's something that needs to happen. I think more in a face-to-face -face setting. And that's why I'm so excited to see these face-to-face groups. Oh yeah. Brown bottle, right? yeah. All over I, I, I love that. And so a quick, quick comment is about training facilitators. Where I think there is this huge opportunity to have a massive impact, um, just this year we actually published a paper called Volunteers. That was all on volunteers. And what we did, we actually looked at um, chip programs that have been run and we've had about uh, 5,000 participants that have been through programs that had been run in a clinical setting and we compared it to about 5,000 participants who had been um, involved in programs that had been run at the local community centre or the local church by Auntie Betty, who has no health background training at all. Because what happens is they don't have to be a content expert. All they have to do is be good at rallying a group of people into a room and then go, hey, let's watch a video. And then there's the, the content expert who presents the information. And then they just ask a couple of questions like, what did that make you think about? What did you learn that was new to you just then? How could we actually apply that in our lives? And so what happens is these people don't have to be health trained uh, and there's nothing you know, risky about what they're doing. So all of a sudden you have this potential to tap in. What I believe, you've got an aging generation, you've got you know, the baby boomers, very um, service focused, you know, give back. And we could actually resource these people with really simple toolkit 
that they can actually take and and and, and you run in their within their search influence. So I that's I get really excited about that potential. I think there's mass, massive social capital in volunteers, and yeah, there's huge potential. For that. Yes, yes, brother. Um, in the environment space, yeah. the big frustration is that the onus is on the individual and there's not higher level support in allowing the people to do things that they might want to do. I was wondering if you get that frustration in this area, for example, people might want to get out but there's no cycle path. There is now, but you know, we didn't have for a while. Is that a frustration in this space as well, that government's not giving the support that you like? Yeah, so this question from Jace is that a frustration that um, that maybe people don't have access to the resources and the you know the the to make it easy for them. yeah to make it easy to engage. Look, it is you know what we actually know is that uh, people's access their environment is a is a quite a powerful shaper of people's lifestyle choices because it's and their default behaviours. Right, so for example, if you don't have access. You know, I actually have people who say, oh, look, we live out whoop whoop, you know, particularly in, for example, in some, certain Indigenous communities where they just don't have access to fresh fruit and vegetables. You know, it's, it's harder to eat healthy if you don't have that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I've, I've done stuff. Well, I've been to um, uh, Dubai and they will talk about exercising, you know, when it's 48 degrees outside. Mm. It's a bit harder. So you know what? There's there's potential to think creatively about that. Like they opted their shopping centres will open up open up at seven a.m. for walking groups just because it's air conditioning. So, but yes, certainly then then there are environmental constraints to you know to, to the way people can uh, engage in healthy lifestyle behaviours. I think it's a yeah, and obviously I'm not going to be able to solve those problems, but um, yeah. Any other questions? It's about 10 to, which is time to wrap up anyway. But hey, thanks for coming and joining us and listening in. And in October, Brett will be sharing um, his work too. And I've actually asked Brett to share his, his the story, I suppose, of his, his research career because, as you know, he's done exceptional things. So look forward to seeing you all then. Bring your friends. And, um, yeah, we'll be seeing you again. Thanks for coming. Thanks, thanks for coming.